thank you for inviting me. It's a thrill to be here uh, on the Cambridge campus of Google. And as I'm sure all of you well know, we are, for the past year and a half, we've been in a sort of renewed discussion of inclusion of women in the tech sector, the experience of women in the tech sector. This is a conversation that we periodically seem to have. And I'm here to remind you that women helped create and found the tech sector, uh, so much of which was created and pioneered during World War II. My book, Code Girls, is not about coding so much as it is about code breaking. During World War II, our code breaking force was actually uh, larger than the British force at, at, at Bletchley Park, and more than half of it was female. Uh, and this is an untold story. I think of it as a mashup of the imitation game and, uh, and the greatest generation, actually, because these women were the hidden figures of the greatest generation, so a mashup of, of all three of those. And I like to start my talks uh, with this slide, which sort of depicts the plight of the educated woman in 1942. Uh, this shows the May Court at Goucher College in the spring of 1942. Uh, a May Court, as far as I could tell, it was a very common thing for colleges to have at the time. It was sort of a vestige, I think, of a pagan fertility ritual in which uh, <laughs> young uh, female college seniors are dressed in virginal white and, and symbolically ushered into the marriage market. And and Goucher College at that time was a, what what would they call a girls school. Uh, the women who went there were called Goucher Girls. It was an all-female college in urban Baltimore, Maryland. It's now co-educational in suburban Towson. But at the time, it was all-female. It had been founded, like most women's colleges, uh, in the late 19th century at a time when people generally believed that higher education was not only unnecessary for women, but not necessarily good for women, uh, that it sort of made women overeducated, obnoxious, difficult to live with. There was actually a Harvard physician, this is no kidding, who argued that higher education made women infertile because it swelled their brains at the expense of their wombs. Uh, and, and people accepted that or some version of that viewpoint about the pointlessness, really, of giving women too much education. And so schools like Goucher and the Seven Sisters schools, uh, many of which are here in Massachusetts, were founded to tilt against that viewpoint, to show that women deserved an education uh, and that, that women could, could succeed in a difficult uh, learning environment. So these were very academically uh, academically ambitious schools uh, that were founded to educate young women. And the women on this platform were, were more unusual than they would even have realized in the sense that at this time only 4% of American women achieved a four-year college degree. And one reason for that was because of this attitude that, you know, that it wasn't necessarily good for women to become overeducated. And of course because so many campuses in that day were still closed to women. The Ivy League was largely closed to women. My home state of Virginia, the University of Virginia actually held out for as long as it could into the late 1960s before it would award a full four-year degree to women. And so there were many campuses that were closed to women, uh, and there were many families, particularly coming out of the Depression, that were reluctant to pay the tuition for a girl to go to college because even if a young woman was very motivated and did very well, in terms of jobs that were available after graduation, really the only job a woman could count on upon graduating from a fine institution was teaching school. And that's great if you want to be a school teacher, but if you want to be an engineer or an architect or a lawyer or a physician, if you're a woman, you would largely be shut out of of those graduate schools and those business networks, so many families would do the calculation and conclude that it wasn't worthwhile uh, to educate a daughter. But one reason that a family might decide to send a girl to a girl's school like Goucher would be so she could get the proverbial MRS degree, so that she could date and hopefully marry a young man attending a neighboring men's school, like in this case Johns Hopkins or Annapolis, the Naval Academy, which was 20 miles away uh, from, from Goucher. And so many, I've interviewed many of the young women on this platform, and, uh, or some of them at least, uh, and uh, 
Uh, they recall a lot of dating and also enormous pressure to get married. And so they experienced sort of the twin pressures back then of wanting to do well and prove that women deserve to be educated, <coughs> but knowing that they, that they were under a lot of pressure to get married by graduation. And so just to show you, for example, how strong this pressure was, at Wellesley College in Massachusetts, the yearbook in the class of 42 actually had a section naming all of the young women who were engaged to be married and who they were engaged to be married to, as well as names of women who had left before graduation in order to get married and who they had married. So that's how intense the pressure was to get married. That's why they had rituals like the May Court to symbolize that they were being ushered into the marriage market. Wellesley at the time had something called the senior class hoop roll, and the lore around the hoop roll was that the winner of that would be the class's first bride. What I love about this particular photo, though, is it shows how the world was changing uh, and how the trajectory of these women's lives was about to change enormously. So if you look at this young woman where the cursor is, her name was Jacqueline Jenkins. Uh, later on, after she married, after the war, her married name would be Jacqueline Jenkins Nye, mother of Bill Nye the Science Guy. Uh, so you can get a sense of her intellectual chops. And this was her good friend, Gwyneth Gaminder. And these two young women had already been secretly tapped by the US Navy to learn how to become code breakers. Uh, so they were being ushered into an arcane field that nobody in the United States would, would have heard of at that time. Um, Code making and code breaking, as you may know, many people in this room might have uh, indulged in it at some point in your lives or now. It's an impulse that goes back really to the beginning of human communication. As long as we've been able to write and speak, we have at some point had the urge to communicate secretly with somebody using a code or cipher that nobody else can break. And if you don't believe that this is true, when I speak to elementary school audiences and I ask those kids how many people in that classroom have made a secret code or cipher at some point in their lives, every hand goes up because it's it's also uh, you know a really universal impulse that children feel to communicate without adults being able to listen in. So. Julius Caesar had a cipher. You might have heard of it. Uh, he moved. Uh, they moved. Uh, you would move a letter four um, four spaces ahead in the alphabet and substitute that letter. That's called a substitution cipher. As you may know, the mark of a good code and cipher is that ease of use between the people who know the system and unbreakability uh, for, by the rest of the world. So the, ci the cipher that Caesar used would satisfy the ease of use, but not the uh, not the unbreakability uh, in terms of the rest of the world. That's pretty easy cipher uh, actually to break. So these young women were being ushered into a field that has existed since the dawn of communication that was very familiar in Europe for centuries before this time uh, because of diplomatic intrigue, because of wars between European countries uh, and kingdoms. But in the United States, we were more naive about what was called listening in or reading other gentlemen's mail. Uh, we were reluctant before the war to do it, but we were having to learn to do it pretty quickly. Uh, and so so these young women, these two young women, along with about a dozen of their Goucher classmates, were being secretly trained in a locked classroom at the top of Goucher Hall, taught by a naval officer, as well as an English professor named Ola Winslow. Nobody on this platform knew that they were being prepared for a completely different future than the one that had been envisioned for them. Their families didn't know, their brothers didn't know, their boyfriends didn't know, their roommates didn't know that they were secretly training to become naval code breakers. And the reason that those young women had been tapped to learn how to do this work, of course, was because on December 7, 1941, we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. It was a surprise attack. Uh, our fleet was anchored in Pearl Harbor. Uh, the, the, the goal of the Japanese was to destroy our Pacific fleet and to drive us to our knees. It had the opposite effect, of course. It galvanized the American public. Every young man wanted to sign up to fight. Uh, and so. It was, world, so the attack at Pearl Harbor was the galvanizing event that propelled us into World War II. We declare war on Japan the next day. Germany declares war on us uh, several days later. And all of a sudden, we were in what was called at the time total war, global war. All of a sudden, men are shipping out on aircraft carriers in the Pacific Ocean, on convoys going across the Atlantic Ocean to, to Europe and to North Africa. And so 
we are suddenly at war at exactly the time when we understand just how unprepared we are in terms of our intelligence gathering abilities because the other thing that Pearl Harbor was was a massive intelligence failure. So I'm from the Washington, D.C. area. We take for granted that we have 17 intelligence agencies in Washington now. We had none of that at the beginning of World War II when we are suddenly sending so many young American men into harm's way. We have been reminded or we have been sort of woken up to uh, the, our inability to anticipate what the enemy is going to do. Uh, Pearl Harbor was a terrible surprise, particularly to the U.S. military, particularly to the U.S. Navy, and heads are going to roll as a result of, of that terrible surprise. And so what will happen in Washington, D.C. is that we will start to very try to quickly build up our intelligence gathering operation. The Office of Strategic Services will be formed our first really um, spy network, which will become the CIA. But it takes time to build a spy network in, in foreign countries. And what we could learn how to do much more quickly was intercept enemy signals and learn how to break the enemy code systems. So, if you've seen the imitation game, you're familiar with at least one of these code systems, which, which is the cipher that's being generated by the Enigma machine that the Germans are using. All of the German military services, uh, particularly the U-boats, we're concerned about. Admiral Donitz is communicating with every U-boat uh, using enciphered communications that have been scrambled by the Enigma machine that is in every U-boat. Uh, and so that's just an example of one system that's being used during the war. And just to give you a sense of how many enciphered and encoded systems are now racing through the airwaves, if you think of how many communications you send through the air every day, right? Emails, tweets, Instagrams, Facebook updates, everything that you send all day long, you might be sending them now. If you are, it's fine. But you can imagine, you know, if you individually are sending this many messages, think about during World War II, this far-flung war in which enemy commanders and uh, are, are, are having to communicate over thousands of miles, right, with the people that they command. Admiral Donitz is communicating with every U-boat. Some of the U-boats are thousands of, you know, 100,000 miles away uh, from his command. And so all of these enciphered and encoded communication systems are traveling through the airwaves, radio waves. They are being encoded and enciphered, sent generally using Morse code. And that is what we have to learn how to snatch out of the airwaves and decipher in order that there not be another Pearl Harbor attack as we are sending our young men into harm's way. So the U.S. Navy knows that it has to ramp up practically overnight. It has to, as we would say today, scale up its code-breaking force uh, practically overnight. And it has to do this at exactly the moment when the young men it would normally recruit to learn how to do this work are suddenly unavailable because they're fighting. Uh, and so the Navy before World War II had a very small code-breaking bureau. It was not a prestigious occupation in the U.S. Navy. You can imagine if you're a career naval officer, you want to be commanding a ship. You want to be out there on the ocean. So there was a very small code-breaking force. And there were monthly memos that were generated to say where they were getting the, the sort of minds that they needed in order to learn how to do this work. Uh, so this was uh, when I was doing my research at the National Archives, I, I looked through these, these monthly memos. And normally, before the war, the Navy would have turned to MIT. It would have turned to Harvard. It would turn to places of the Ivy League to find young men who were trainable to do this work. And you can see in this memo the light bulb moment going on over some naval bureaucrat's head. Since the young men are unavailable to us, let's see what these educated young women can do. So you see I've circled new source women's colleges. The light bulb moment goes on. Let us try these educated and trained young women who have been at these great schools. They've had Latin. They've had Greek. They've had physics. They've had math. They've had English. Uh, you know, they had this really great liberal arts education. Uh, so let's see if they can if they can serve the nation. Uh, and so young women at Goucher, as well as all of the Seven Sisters colleges, Wellesley, Smith, Radcliffe, Bryn Mawr, young women would be secretly identified by their math and astronomy professors. They would be invited in one by one to secret conferences. It was like the Harry Potter moment for these young women when you get the letter. Uh, and so they would be invited in. They would be asked two questions. Do you like crossword puzzles? And are you engaged to be married? <laughs> and if they answered yes to the first and no to the second, then they would be invited to take a secret correspondence course that the US Navy had developed 
to train its cryptographers, to train its, its crypt analysts and, and code breakers. And they would come to Washington, D.C., this first cohort of women who would train all during their senior year at the same time that they were doing all the academic work they needed to graduate. They would come to Washington at exactly the moment when we understand in a major way how important code breaking is going to be to the outcome of this war. And keep in mind that in 1942, it was not foreordained that we were going to win World War II, that the Allies were going to win World War II. It looked very bleak, right? All of Europe now is occupied or is an Axis country. Uh, Japan is a very, very formidable foe in the Pacific. So we do not anticipate that we're going to win this war. It's a very, very scary moment. And so so the women, after they graduate in, the, in June of 1942, are they're exhorted by the U.S. Navy to come to Washington as soon as they can. There are so many of them that they're sitting on upturned wastebaskets in the very crowded Central Naval Facility. And in June of 42, if you've heard of any battle in World War II, any sea battle, you probably heard of the Battle of Midway. And that was a very important battle in the Pacific that turned on our ability to break the Japanese naval fleet code. And the reason that we knew how that fleet code worked was because a woman named Agnes Driscoll, a math and music teacher from Texas had been a civilian working in the Navy's Code Breaking Bureau, and she had diagnosed that the J Japanese Naval Fleet Code consisted of five-digit code groups, might stand for, let's say, destroyer, uh, five digits, and then they would add to encipher that code group, they would add five digits to that code group to encipher each digit, right, to change each digit using something called non-curing addition. Agnes Driscoll had spent the 1930s figuring out how the Japanese system worked. The reason that we weren't able to read those messages right before Pearl Harbor was because the Japanese had changed their code books, as they did periodically. And then we would have to start all over again figuring out what the code group stood for. But we were back in by June of 1942. The Japanese had set out to ambush us on the island of Midway and finish off our Pacific fleet. We read those messages. We were waiting to ambush the ambushers. We defeated the Japanese in a three-day sea battle that's now one of the most famous sea battles of all time. And all of a sudden, it's understood that code breaking is no longer an obscure, unprestigious occupation. It's going to be central to victory in both theaters of war. And so the women are pouring into Washington at exactly the moment when, when we understand how important their work is going to be. So just to give you a sense of the division of labor when we enter the war, if you've seen the imitation game, you know that the British, thanks to Alan Turing, and, and a large code-breaking force have diagnosed how the German Enigma system works. So the, the British are going to be the lead code-breakers for the Atlantic Ocean and the European theater, at least at the outset. But we're going to be a junior partner working with them because we are now at risk, right? We're sending all these young men across the Atlantic. The convoys are being terribly menaced by the wolf packs uh, that the U-boats are sinking our convoys. Uh, but but the, we're going to let the British take the lead on that, at least at first. But we have lead code-breaking responsibility for the massive Pacific Ocean, where we have just been terribly surprised not that long ago. And so the US Navy is going to be primarily responsible for breaking the Japanese naval fleet code. So that's what those young women are going to do. But meanwhile, our US Army has responsibility for a completely different set of codes and ciphers being used by the Japanese Army, which is now spread out on all these islands around the Pacific, right? The Japanese have taken the Philippines. They've taken Guam. They've taken Wake Island. They've taken the Malay Peninsula. They've taken all of these land masses. And the Japanese Army is communicating back with Tokyo. And so our US Army is ultimately going to need thousands of code breakers to break these systems, and it also needs women. And so World War II is this wonderful, terrible moment where there is unparalleled competition for the first time for smart, educated women to show what they can do. So the private sector is going to start uh, competing for women. MIT is going to start taking women into its graduate programs to run its analog computers. And the US Navy and the US Army are going to start a hot competition for educated women. Uh, when I was doing my research, I found memos in which the Navy was pissed off because the Army got to Wheaton College or Connecticut College before it got there. Uh, and it argued that, that the Army was poaching its girls. So, <laughs> Um, so when the U.S. Army has to figure out where it's going to get its educated women, it decides to turn to teachers' colleges as well. These are humbler institutions. 
where women are being trained to become school teachers. Uh, so I'll just show you, because you'll hear from her at the very end. Dorothy Ramali was training to be a math teacher at Indiana State Teachers College in Pennsylvania. Uh, to be a math teacher was a high aspiration for a woman, because a lot of departments wouldn't hire women as math professors. This is my central character, Dot Braden. She's still alive. She'll be 99 this June. Uh, so back in 1942, she was a school teacher in Chatham, Virginia. And what I love about the Army's recruiting strategy, which is different from the Navy's, the Army decided that, that recruiting women secretly at teachers' colleges wouldn't be enough for its needs. So it decided to massively recruit in public uh, trying to get women to sign up to do secret war work in Washington. So it decided to recruit school teachers, actual school teachers, young, overworked, underpaid young women who by definition were single because in almost any occupation at the time, if you were a woman and you got married, you were expected to quit and stay home. And that was certainly true of school teachers. So these women were the ideal workers. That's the way we would think of them today. Underpaid, overworked, single. They could work full time. They could work in the middle of the night, which they would be called upon to do. And the Army strategy to recruit these women was to send its handsomest young army officers out to lurk in post offices and hotels. Initially, it was confined to the southern states, to a particular bureaucratic uh, division, because it was recruiting civilians. And so the thinking on the part of the Army was that these young women would be induced to sign up, would be lured to Washington, hoping that they would make a marriage to a handsome young man like the officer who was recruiting them. And what I love about Dot is she shows how wrong-headed this strategy was. In fact, in 1942, Dot was a graduate of randolph Macon. Women's College, which was a fine women's college in, in downtown Lynchburg, Virginia, which is where she grew up. She was the oldest daughter in a family of four. Her mother was supporting the whole family as a secretary at a uniform factory. Um, her parents were separated. Her mom was supporting the family. Dot was now working as a school teacher. Uh, her income was very important to the family upkeep. She had two younger brothers who were now in the fighting. Like every young American woman, she wanted to do her part to bring the boys home. She also wanted to get out of a marriage that she uh, had been sort of pressured into entering into. Her college boyfriend had sent her a ring, an engagement ring from training camp in California. She didn't want to marry him. She liked him, but she didn't want to spend the rest of her life with him. Uh, and, but she didn't know how to get out of it, because women at the time were told to not upset the morale of the troops. That was a big deal. Women were entrusted with the morale of, of the fighting force. And so she didn't feel like she could send the ring back. But the chance to go to Washington and do unspecified secret war work uh, was, a, was a way to get out of a marriage. She wouldn't have to follow him to training camp in California the way that he was pressuring her. So I just love the fact that the recruiting strategy was exactly wrong-headed, even as she was very uh, inclined to take this job, uh, to sign on the dotted line and come to Washington. Her other motivation was to come to Washington. Lynchburg, Virginia is three hours away from Washington, DC. She had never been to the nation's capital. She grew up there during the Depression. Her family didn't have a car. She had never seen the big city. And Washington now is really the beating heart of the free world. Along with London, England, you know, it's the major capital free city. So much of Europe is occupied now. It would really become the heart of the Allied war effort. And the chance to come to Washington and serve that effort was an enormous opportunity for her to help bring her brothers home and also to, um, to make twice as much money as she could as a school teacher. She was making $900 a year teaching school in Chatham. She would make $1,600 a year uh, working as a code breaker. So in the fall of 1943, she found herself in Union Station. She took a cab to a place called Arlington Hall. Before the war, it had been at what, with what they called a junior college, which was a thing back then, again, when it was thought that it was best not to give women too much education. A junior college was a place where a family could send its uh, daughter to board. She could get high school classes, as well as a couple years of maybe college English and French, as well as sort of typing and horseback riding and deportment and the kind of skills that were thought for a, um, you know, sort of right for a, an upscale young woman. Uh, the, the US military needed secure facilities for its massive code breaking forces. So it kicked those girls out of Arlington Hall. It moved the code breakers in, built uh, temporary buildings. You can see here uh, the school teachers now being trained. Here they're learning the geography of Asia. 
You can see them intercept, uh, receiving intercepted messages from the Pacific. And you can see how big these rooms were of former school teachers uh, coming now to work for the war effort. And what Dot still has a hard time getting her mind around is that she became part of one of the three most important code-breaking successes of World War II. And she didn't even understand the importance of the work that she was doing. So two of them you've already heard of. Our breaking of the German Enigma cipher was one of the most important code-breaking triumphs. We've heard of that because of the imitation game and because of places like Bletchley Park that exist now as museums. Uh, the Battle of Midway and our breaking of the Japanese naval fleet code was number two. But number three, which you don't hear as much about, was our breaking of the super enciphered system being used by the Japanese army to communicate with its supply ships. So the Japanese army spread out on these islands around the Pacific. Everything that's brought to them, food, fuel, re reinforcement troops, uh, replacement parts for aircraft, it all has to be brought by ship. These are formal commercial ships that have been now commandeered by the Japanese army. They're called Marus. Uh, they are traveling around the Pacific and other bodies of water. They're communicating with their central command, what they're carrying, where they're headed for. We are intercepting all of those messages. They're being sent back to the school teachers. So it's 242 school teachers, including Dot Braden, who are breaking those messages systems as fast as they could. Dot remembers running to the overlapper station, which was the next station of what was basically an assembly line. The women would break the message as fast as they could so that the contents could be radioed to an American submarine commander who would be waiting on the horizon when the supply ship appeared as a result of how fast and well the school teachers worked and how well the submarine commanders did their job, we sank thousands and thousands of supply ships to the point where most Japanese army deaths were the result of starvation and disease because they weren't getting the supplies that they needed. So that's how important uh, the messages were that DOT was breaking. Again, these, these uh, slides just give you a sense of how massive the, uh, the operation was. I'll just talk very quickly about one more system to give you a sense of how many systems there were. Uh, this group of women were breaking the cipher system being used by Japanese diplomats. They were using a machine that we called purple uh, to scramble the romanized letters of, of a Japanese transmission. So this might seem counterintuitive, but Japanese diplomats are stationed in Europe, right? They're stationed in Germany, they're in Vichy France, they're in occupied France, they're in Italy. They're, they're all over Europe. They're communicating with Hitler and, with, and with, with Mussolini and with all of the Axis leaders. And they're reporting it all back to Tokyo in very, very detailed, wordy diplomatic messages. We were reading every single one of those messages thanks to a woman named Genevieve Grochen, a graduate of the University of Buffalo, who before the war had the key insight that enabled us to break that machine-generated cipher. She had been unable to find any university willing to hire a female math teacher. So she had been hired by the Army's very small pre-war code-breaking bureau and had the central insight that, that allowed us to break that machine cipher. And just to give you a sense of how valuable this intelligence was, when the Japanese diplomats were invited to tour the coast of France, they were invited to see Hitler's Atlantic Wall, right? His fortifications along the coast of France. They reported back where it was well fortified, where it wasn't, so that when we were planning the D-Day landings, we knew that Normandy would be a better place to invade than a, than a better, fi better fortified spot like Calais. So again, that's the quality of the intelligence uh, that was being produced by these code and cipher systems. Again, you can see how many women and how exclusively female uh, many, of these, many of these rooms were. There was also an African-American code-breaking unit for the Army. So the U.S. Army was segregated during World War II. So was the Army's civilian code-breaking force. Uh, but there was a group of African-American code-breakers again, who had achieved their college education in a, you know, despite enormous barriers in a segregated school system. And they were working the codes and ciphers of the private sector. So that'll be familiar to you at Google, familiar to everybody who does any kind of transaction online. Just today, as we hope that our financial transactions are enciphered after we make them and encrypted, which is our modern word for encipherment, uh, 
so too were banks and companies and encrypting their communications during the war. And so this force was, um, this, this group was assigned to the codes and ciphers of the private sector to make sure nobody was doing business with Hitler or doing business with Japanese companies like Mitsubishi. So that was very important work as well. So just quickly, the Navy women, so the women on that platform graduating from Goucher in their frilly white dresses are now working for the U.S. Navy, as, and they are actually in the U.S. Navy. So this is another tipping point for women. World War II uh, sees the creation of the waves, women accepted for volunteer emergency service. Uh, other forces, other branches of the military will create female uh, divisions as well. And so the Navy decides that it wants its female code breakers to actually be in uniform and to be subject to military hierarchy. So the women are sent back. They're actually sent to Smith College to officers training camp. And they will return to Washington uh, as full naval officers. And also, this is a great moment because women who haven't had the benefit of a college education can enlist in the U.S. Navy, uh, and if they test high for aptitude, their math abilities or their language abilities, then they will also be routed into the code breaking operations. So ultimately, the U.S. Navy will have 4,000 women working. This is a facility that is on Nebraska Avenue in Washington, D.C. They, it was also a girls' school. They kicked the women out. They built barracks. They moved the female naval code breakers in. You can see, again, how female these code breaking offices are and you can see the camaraderie of, um, of the women working in these, uh, in these offices. Uh, and just a quick anecdote because it's one of my favorite anecdotes. Uh, to give you a sense of what it was like for these women to come together from all over the country ultimately, one of the women in my, uh, in my book, Jane Case Tuttle, remembers enlisting in the U.S. Navy, uh, and she was actually the daughter of a very affluent family. Her dad was a physicist, Theodore Case, and she thought uh, when she enlisted in the U.S. Navy that she would be made a naval officer because she came from such an elite family. Uh, her family didn't want her to join the Navy. It was considered somewhat scandalous for young women to go into the military at first. Some people thought they were bad girls, but she very much wanted to join the war effort. And so she took the subway from the Upper East Side of Manhattan down to a naval recruiting station around Wall Street. And she knew that going in as an officer, she would have to take an eye exam, and she was very very nearsighted. Uh, and so she had memorized the eye chart. And she slipped her spectacles into her pocket, and she passed the eye exam. Uh, but then she had to go around to all of these other medical stations to, to, to sort of get basically the equivalent of a physical. And she got to the place where the women were told to strip down and disrobe, because men joining the US Navy had to undergo a group naked physical. And so the women had to as well. And so Jane had gone to a very fancy women's boarding school, girls' school on the Upper East Side. She had never seen another woman without her clothes on. Uh, the word breast was never uttered uh, at her fancy boarding, at her fancy school. Uh, so she had to take her clothes off. And then a petty officer came up and drew a number between her breasts, the number nine, and red marker between her breasts, and said, all right, now go stand between eight and 10 for your physical. And Jane was so nearsighted uh, that she not only had to really look at the other women, but she had to really get up close and peer in order to figure out where she was supposed to stand. So that was her welcome to the U.S. Navy. She's never forgotten it. Uh, and her other welcome was that she thought she would go in as an officer, but because she was a graduate of, I believe it's called the Longy uh, Music School here actually in the Boston area, that was not considered by the, the Navy the equivalent of a college degree. So she went in as, as what was called an ordinary seaman, as an enlisted woman. Uh, so she had to actually live in the barracks along with all of the other enlisted women, and she loved it. It was the great moment of her life, getting out of sort of debutante society and being able to live uh, alongside and work alongside women from all over the country. It was an incredibly important moment for her. Uh, she, re she recalls working in these, in these rooms uh, with incredible pride, which was true of all of these women. In fact, this is a quote from Jane. She could tell, we, we could tell what was happening in the Pacific because the stack would get larger. So you can see the Japanese naval messages piled up on these women's desks. They are breaking these naval messages as fast as they can because they know that we are pushing back across the Pacific. Of course, the ultimate goal is to retake the Philippines and then possibly attack uh, the Japanese mainland. Uh, and so the women know that their brothers and boyfriends are out there. In some cases, they're breaking messages that foretell the fate of their brothers and boyfriends' ships. And they want to do everything they can. They have to do a lot of triage 
uh, to determine which are the most important messages uh, and then move them along as fast as they can. You can see this is just a worksheet that I found in the National Archives. You can see that they're working this five-digit super enciphered system. So they're doing the brain work in order to subtract out the encipherment uh, re reversing the false math, the non-carrying addition that's been used, they're, they're having to reverse engineer that in order to get down to the code group and then tell what that code group stands for in order to know what the ship is carrying and where it's going to be. Uh, and so these are just some worksheets that I found in the National Archives that show the brain work. And again, just very briefly, we will eventually take over the Atlantic breaking of the Enigma cipher from the British. Uh, so it turned, so the Germans get suspicious that we have broken the Enigma cipher, as we have. And the German Navy makes its Enigma machines more complicated. It adds a rotor. There were three rotors originally to scramble the German messages. They add a fourth rotor. And so the British machines that Alan Turing helped design no longer work. Uh, well enough to break those systems. So we build these faster, bigger machines at, um, at, at a factory in Dayton, Ohio. They're secretly transported to Washington, D.C., where we take over Atlantic Ocean code breaking. And, and it's pretty much exclusively being done by women who are designing really the equivalent of early computer menus. They're looking at a scrambled German message. They are conjecturing where in that message a German phrase like Biscaya wetter, weather in the Bay of Biscay, might appear. And then they're doing the mental brain work to think, all right, what loop would produce, you know, would turn this letter into this letter and then this letter into this letter. Uh, and so they're designing basically early computer menus that will then be plugged in those, into those machines to see if they are a plausible, uh, what's called key setting. Uh, and then if it is plausible, they'll plug the message into a smaller machine that's basically the equivalent of the Enigma. It will, if it produces an actual German messages, they know they've got it right. That will be translated by women who will then take it to the um, room where another group of women, mostly the Goucher women, are, are maintaining these huge wall maps uh, showing all of the U-boats and their locations. They'll write up intelligence reports for naval headquarters, generating intelligence reports. And as a result of that, and of course the work that was being done in the Atlantic Ocean by submarine uh, commanders, we clear the Atlantic Ocean of the U-boats so that we can send the massive thousands and thousands of convoy ships necessary to mount the D-Day invasion and begin to liberate Europe. And this group of women actually were reading the U-boat messages as the Germans were looking out on the English, uh, English Channel on the morning of June 6th, uh, 1944, and they're seeing uh, the Allied invasion as it starts. And the women experience the landing that way. Uh, and so again, that shows you how crucially important the women's contribution was to the war effort, the kind of intelligence that they were generating that was used by our military. Uh, these are just some photos of their, uh, their brief free time in Washington. That's my center character dot behind a pole there. Uh, the women were writing letters incessantly to keep up morale to the men whose lives they were trying to save. My center character dot would disentangle herself from her uh, college boyfriend, and she was writing at one point about a half dozen men. Uh, she was more reluctant to have that go into the book than the fact of her secret code breaking. She was a little embarrassed that she was writing so many guys. But, um, but in fact, that was really quite common at the time. Uh, and the women were sending a lot of photos as well, sort of the equivalent of selfies. Uh, they were sending, again, to keep up morale to the men overseas. She would make a best friend, uh, a former school teacher from Bourbon, Mississippi. Remember, this was top secret work. The women were told they would be shot if they told anybody what they were doing. So even though both of these women were working on the Japanese supply supply ship code breaking effort, they never talked about it to each other. Uh, they didn't even know that they were part of the same code breaking effort. But their friendship was so strong after the war uh, that they, remem they remained close friends. You can see Dot in the striped shirt, her husband, the, the soldier she was riding, Jim Bruce. Uh, and that's her friend, um, uh, Ruth Weston from Mississippi. Ruth would go on to work for the NSA as a mathematician. So the National Security Agency is our descendant agency of our successful World War II code breaking. Ruth would work as a mathematician for NSA until she became pregnant. And then uh, I found her handwritten resignation note from the 1950s. I resigned my position as a mathematician with the NSA because I'm expected to be home with my children. And so after the war, basically the women were told in secret letters, thanks very much for your service. Now get back, you know, get back home to the kitchen. Uh, and, and most of them 
did leave and go back to private life eventually, either, either immediately or eventually when they had children, they were expected uh, to leave the workforce again. And, uh, at, but their friendships remained so powerfully strong that actually when Ruth Weston was, um, was engaged to her husband, who you saw in that photo, uh, she invited Dot up to, and her husband basically to vet him because she wouldn't agree to marry him until Dot had given the okay. And this is a group of naval enlisted women who um, remained such close friends after the war that they had a chain letter going between their friendship group, and that chain letter kept going for 75 years. Uh, till, till when I was doing my reporting, the woman in the front Ruth Mursky uh, was ultimately the only one of them left, and her email sign-on is Ruth the Wave. So even though she could never talk about her service and never got credit for it uh, anywhere, uh, her identity as a naval enlisted woman and as a naval codebreaker remained that important to her that her email sign-on would be Ruth the Wave. Uh, and so I want to leave time for questions, so I'm just going to show two videos that will uh, just let you hear the voices of the women themselves. Uh, uh, and I have others that are on my website. They're actually all on YouTube. So um, you all can easily enough listen, listen to the other women as well. So this is Dot talking about her train ride to Washington. With my two suitcases, my umbrella, and my raincoat, I went down to the train. Now my uncle had to take me down there. No car. And my mother and her sister were standing there crying when I got on the train. I was very secure that everything was going to be just fine. Washington would receive me with open arms. And of course, her welcome to Washington was being told that she would be shot if she disclosed the nature of the work that she was doing. And so I just want to finish to let you hear the voice of Dorothy Ramali. You saw her photo earlier in the presentation. She was the aspiring math teacher. She was called in by the dean of women at her teacher's college and asked to take the Army's correspondence course. And she gives you the sense of why the women were so motivated to do this work. She remembers seeing all the men in her math class rounded up and put on a bus uh, you know, to go off to, to fight. And, and and, and she recalls sort of the, the emotion of, of that moment. A bus came, and it was at 2 o'clock in the morning that the Army sent a bus to get these, oh, I don't know. It seemed to me it was all the men, you know, that, that there were no men left. Or, in the college at that time because they all had to go, I think, to Pittsburgh. You see, since I was taking mathematics, a lot of times uh, I was one of maybe two girls that were in the classes, you see. So I knew so many of the fellows that were go going on that bus. I'll never forget. And what I also love about Dorothy Ramali is that she became a math teacher after the war at the public middle school in Arlington, Virginia, that my own children would later attend. And so that's an example of how these women continued to walk among us without getting any credit for what they did. And I love the thought of all of these middle schoolers taking Miss Ramali's Algebra One or Algebra Two class and having no idea that this sweet, kind woman, who many of them remember as the best math teacher they ever had, had been a badass code breaker during World War II. She was so good at what she did that the U.S. Navy poached her from the U.S. Army by offering an officer's housing allowance. So she went from the Japanese supply ship code to working the Japanese naval fleet code. That's how good she was. Uh, and so uh, it has really been the honor of my career to get to spend time and, and interview these women about their work and to try to get some uh, attention to the work that they did because it was pioneering. Uh, code breaking, hacking, and computer work that they were doing. Uh, cyber security, cyber intelligence. This is what they were doing. And again, I think of them as the hidden figures of the greatest generation. And their contribution uh, was, uh, was, was remarkable. I mean, it, it helped us win the war. After the war, uh, the estimates was that, that code breaking shortened the war by at least a year, probably more, and saved thousands of lives on all sides, you know, Axis and allied lives, because the war was shortened. Uh, and so I have time to take a couple of questions if you have time before you go back to your workplaces. I'd be happy to uh, field any questions that you have. Thanks for listening.
Given that their work was secret, I'm curious at what point were they allowed to speak about it, and did you have any trouble getting them to talk about it? That's a great question. Thank you for asking. So the story of wartime World War II code break, it began to leak out as, as memoirs and histories began to be written. And so at a certain point in the early 1990s, the story was officially declassified, but nobody tracked down the women and told them that it was okay to talk. So there were, you know, there were more than 10,000 women who did this work. Most of them carried the secret to their graves. Uh, when I was trying to talk Dot Braden into telling me her story, it took me about a half an hour to persuade her that it was finally okay to talk because nobody had given them the go-ahead. Uh, so, uh, so that's why they didn't get credit. And and but she wanted to tell her story because after the war, both of her brothers survived the war and both of them had top secret security clearances in their work after the war. And they would get together and brag about their clearances, and Dot could never tell them that she had a top secret security clearance as well. Uh, so that's how, how frustrating it sometimes was. I assume most of the messages that they were decoding would be in German or Japanese or another language. Were they also then having to take language training so they could recognize words when they came up? Yeah, that's a great question. So the the the, the code systems that you saw that were in that were number groups. Uh, so let's say it stood for rice. Let's say the code group stood for, you know, we're carrying rice. You didn't have to necessarily even think the Japanese word for rice. You could think the English word for rice. So some of the systems, you didn't really have to know much Japanese. And the military, you know, these supply ships, it, there was a pretty limited vocabulary uh, that the supply ships would be using. So they could be taught a little bit of Japanese, the names of islands and things like that, and, and work with those, um, those numerical code systems. But if it was the Enigma machine, which was scrambling German messages, or if if it was the Japanese purple machine, which was taking Romanized, that's essentially phonetic spelling of Japanese uh, that is then scrambled by the machine. And then what you get at the end is, again, phonetically spelled Japanese. They did need translators. So if, if, a, if a young woman from the Seven Sisters had majored in German, she would be snatched up to work in the Enigma unit. And similarly, it, there weren't many people who knew Japanese, but, but some people who did were missionaries. And so graduates of Bible colleges would actually be recruited to work as Japanese uh, translators. And in fact, the Japanese surrender message, the first person who read that was a young woman who was a graduate of Bethany College in West Virginia. She had been a missionary, and so she was being used as a translator. So she was the first person who read the Japanese surrender message. I'm curious, what made you interested in this subject area? Why did you start to research it? I happened to have a conversation with a group of historians at the NSA. All of our, most of our federal agencies have wonderful historians offices, like the FBI does, the CIA does, the NSA does. And I was speaking to uh, a woman historian there and a uh, woman who's a curator at the, uh, we have a little cryptography museum in Fort Meade, Maryland that is our equivalent of Bletchley Park. And they told me this story uh, based on some documents that I had come across. Uh, I was talking to them and they spent uh, several hours with me and later out this story at a time when I didn't know anything about code breaking. I look back at some of the questions I asked them and sort of my level of ignorance is, is embarrassing. But um, uh, so the minute I heard the story, I thought it would be an incredible story to tell. And, and this is a, a time period when uh, hidden figures had not yet been published. Uh, uh, there was a great book called Rise of the Rocket Girls that wasn't out yet. So there were a number of books that were percolating along kind of simultaneously about women's contributions to the STEM field and to American history. Uh, and so the minute they told me the story, I knew that I would like to try to tell it. And I just had to ascertain whether or not I could find any women who would be in their mid-90s, uh, you know, who could tell me about the work, and whether I could find documentation to support their recollections, because of course I couldn't use their recollections unless I could document it. And I was surprised at how, I had to have a lot of records declassified, it took about a year and a half, but there was a lot of information already in the archives at the National Archives uh, who, that had just really been neglected by historians, I must say. Does the Cryptographic Museum now have copies of your book? I think that's a good question, I think it does, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have to check. <laughs> Thank you for asking. So this sounds like a story that more people need to hear. Will there be a movie? Uh, <laughs> it, has, it has been optioned, and it's working its way through that process. So I agree. I mean, that really is how um, many, you know, many people come to stories like this. So fingers crossed. <laughs>
Did you find any records in the colleges, like in all of the Seven Sisters colleges? Did they keep their own records about the women who left during the war? That's a great question. Oh, I'm sorry, women who left during the war to do this work? Yes. Yes. So Wellesley College in particular has done a good job, a really good job of, of maintaining those archives, and Goucher has as well. Some of the other schools really didn't even necessarily know that it had happened because very few records were kept. And the only reason that Wellesley, one of the reasons is, is a class of 19, a, a member of the class of 1942 decided to send surveys to all of her female classmates to find out what they did during the war. And, 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 and a number of them wrote to say, well, I was a code breaker. Uh, and this was the first inkling, really, that, that any of their classmates had of what they had done. And I went and looked at those archives. And it's fascinating, though, to see what the other women were doing as well. You really get a sense of how women were being suddenly recruited by Armstrong Cork, uh, by you know all of the defense contractors, uh, they're all out there reading blueprints and and you know using their math and, and language educations in, in so many different capacities. Uh, so that was actually that was a wonderful trove of documents. It really gave me a sense of and the women themselves remember. They said you know we had so few recruiters on campus in 1941 and everything changed by 1942. Thank you for spending your work day with me.